So, you know, why am I sitting here and why do I have a voice in, in this space? Well, number one, I, I live with bipolar. I have done for over a decade. This has given me very personal experience of looking after my mental health. Um, my mother has bipolar type one, so I've seen it from the other side as a relative. I've seen it as a doctor, as an NHS psychiatrist, and now I've started to become a campaigner um, within the NHS, but also within other charities like Mind and Bipolar UK. And then lastly, almost most importantly, or most relevant today, I also know what it feels like to run small business um, and the stresses and strains or the very unique stresses and strains that come with that. So first of all, uh, the science, um, and I'm just gonna make sure I can see the chat actually, because I can't see it at the moment. Um, one second. Nick, if anything comes through, we can uh, let you know as well, yeah? Oh uh, yeah, that would be great actually, yeah. But um, Okay, so um, I can see it now. So yeah, anyone at any point, just do put anything. Oh, here we go, we've already got a question, great. Um, so Catherine, yes, so difference between type one and type two, I'll keep this short. Um, if you want to know more at any point, anyone, you can always reach out to me. I'm always happy to talk about this topic. It's, it's a real passion of mine, but basically type one is what you would traditionally think of as bipolar. It's the, when you go from being manic, um, which is where you go so high in your mood, do you become delusional so that you actually think um, or your construct of reality is different to other people's and however much a psychiatrist or a friend or a relative tries to explain to you um, the way in which the world works, you will not budge. You, your view of the world is the correct view of the world. And that really often demonstrates itself in kind of delusions of grandeur. So you might start thinking that you're connected to the royal family. You might start thinking that your business is actually only has, is worth around a few million is actually um, worth hundreds of millions. So that's when you go really high to the point of being delusional, but you also experience oppressive side as well and you need to feel the lows and the highs to have bipolar but type one is when you go at to the point of being manic type two is when you stop and you never get to that point of being delusional so you get those early feelings of being really high energy really positive quite arrogant running around doing lots of things quite different behavior but actually if you're sat down and talked to you can still understand um, the kind of realities of today so it's that line there that differentiates type one and type two so I hope that answers um, enough for today. Um, why do I put this reference here to mind and body? I think it's worth just really quickly referencing the cultural kind of background and the history around how we perceive mental health. Because in principle, um, it's quite odd actually that we see things differently. Why do we have totally different funding structures between mental health and physical health? And that's to do a lot with actually basic anatomy that people back in the enlightenment were seeing. So when you actually look at the anatomy, the mind or the brain is separated from the other organs through um, what's called the blood brain barrier so all of our other organs are provided with the infrastructure of the blood supply and that's what um, allows nutrients and the the um, hormones and all the different ingredients that we need to be able to um, those organs to work um, happen but the brain has what's called cerebrospinal fluid and there's this separation so when people were anatomically opening up skulls looking at these brains they perceived the, the mind and the brain to be completely separate to the body and this fed into our understanding of how um, the mind and body interacted and so people like Descartes were all about this thing called du dualism so there was a separation between mind and body this meant that for a couple of centuries medicine and the way in which we thought about the mind and body was very different to how we actually understand it now um though so actually now we know there is no um separation the there is these anatomical differences but actually that blood brain barrier there's huge amounts of communication between it um so they are actually one and the same and i think just quickly saying here some of this people already know but i'm just keeping it basic for now but the nervous system is what connects the brain uh, to the body um, it's the nerves that within the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system that basically tells the organs to do what they need to do in different states and the obvious or simplest way to describe this is between fight and flight as in the sympathetic nervous system and rest and digest the parasympathetic nervous system so there'll be some very simple um, sensory input that the brain detects that will tell it whether we're in certain states of mind, which will cause certain changes in the way in which our organs respond. So when we're in fight and flight, we want our pupils to expand so that we can actually be more alert and see any risks of danger around us. Our breath rate starts going up because we need more oxygen to prepare to maybe go through um, 
to run away from danger and our heart pumps faster and our guts like actually we don't need to be in rest and digest right now we don't need to be sending much oxygen to the gut and the opposite is true when we're in a parasympathetic state of mind i.e relaxed state of mind so what does this mean kind of practically about how we can perceive looking after our mind today and looking after our wellness so the other important thing to say is is that we have these overarching understanding of the mind and body but actually there is no blood test there's no mri scan to tell us or to diagnose people with mental health problems so you can't say here's someone with depression you can't go into a and e and someone just said and does the scan and says this is what you've got let alone tell you what your wellness routine should be and why is that because it is the mind that is the most complex part of us it's the most recently evolved part of us and that means that we don't understand it very well. It's those 9 billion neuronal connections to the frontal cortex that makes us who we are. So that means that actually the only way to learn is to go out into the world and discover for ourselves what works for us through reflection and finding out through trial and error. It also means that there is no silver bullet. The mind is so complex that not one solution is going to solve all your problems. You have to find solutions across the board. And by this, what I'm really referring to is what's known as the biopsychosocial model. This is the cornerstone of modern psychiatry and psychology. And what it tells you is, is that there are biological factors that influence your mental health. So the most obvious one here being your genetic vulnerability. Some people are born with propensities to have mental health problems. And it's, there are some mental health problems like schizophrenia and bipolar that are very genetic, i.e. if you um, separated two identical twins at birth and you put them in totally different environments, different parents, different geographical situations, different social deprivations, there would still be, if one of them had schizophrenia, the other one would have an 80% chance of having schizophrenia. Bipolar, the number is more like 60%. So genetic factors are really important, but they're only part of the equation. Psychological factors are really important. How have we learned through our own experiences to respond to stress, to respond to life's events that we are all going to have to face at different times so these might be things like were i bullied at school how did that make me respond to my relationships going forward did my parents go through a traumatic divorce at a certain important point in my life did i experience some direct trauma from someone those are good examples and then lastly the thing that's really been left behind in the healthcare setting are social interventions so these are things that are happening to us right now in our own lives our own environment right now so do I have a roof over my head? Am I financially secure? Am I feeling overwhelmed at work? Do I have a loving relationship that I can turn to? So I'm giving you all those examples just to give you a flavor of those increments across the board. And if you really wanna look after your mental health or your mental wellness, you need to be thinking about biological factors, psychological factors, and social factors. And this pint pot model was put together by a guy called Professor Turnbull. Uh, and it's about trying to illustrate how in practice the biopsychosocial model works. So, for example, um, I'm just going to move this out of the way. Is this chat in the way for you? I'll just do this. Um, so what this is showing to you is how these factors or what we would call biopsychosocial stresses start to build up. So some people will have a much bigger biological component to start with. Other people will have bigger psychological components. And then suddenly what we find is slowly but surely that pint fills up. And until it overflows, we don't actually... Um, exhibit or demonstrate any symptoms. And this can mean that actually it can be a very small factor, like for example, not getting a promotion or one old friend um, deciding to behave differently to you or some small upset can actually cause the overflow. And then you can actually start having mental illness symptoms. And what people often find so difficult is they cannot relate the, sig the significance or severity of their mental illness symptoms with anything that's really happened to them recently. So it's really important to contextualize and understand that it is this building up of stress um, that can lead to mental illness symptoms. So with that in mind, um, I hope I've given you a little bit of context there. Please do ask if, you, if some of that was confusing or not. I'm trying to go through quite a lot today. Um, but what I really want to know, and this is what we found so interesting at Mindful and what really got me um, to step back from some of my NHS work and really commit to Mindful was recognizing when we started asking that, this question to people, how varied it was the answers we, we were getting. So if people can put, if they feel happy to in the chat, kind of what you currently do to look after your mind. So these can be the more obvious things like breath work, yoga, being on medication, doing some therapy, or it could be more um, alternative things like um, doing some houseplants, doing puzzles, going um, out for 
doing, for example, one of the things we have on the app at the moment is mud larking. A quiet time is a great one there from Martin. But it would be great to get a few examples here. Oh, great. That, <laughs> Gary, that's not good. We need to do some work there, I think. <laughs> running is a brilliant one. Running is an amazing um, way. I think we all know it. It's just hard sometimes to get around to it. But it's an amazing way to burn through some of that stress. Um, and it's also something that is so relatively in our control to, to actually influence. All art, singing, crochet, crochet brilliant. Crochet is brilliant, these repetitive mindful exercises. Dog walking can be amazing. I think dogs, um, you know, we've seen that in terms of the app at the moment, in terms of the most popular activities that we recommend. It's amazing the, the energy and support that people have all around dog walking. Eating is definitely, I think a lot of the time we need to really reflect upon, you know, most things can be good in moderation. It's just our relationship with those things. So it, I don't often have many things to tell people to stop doing. It's just how, how does it fit into the whole picture? Um, Neil, cycling in the Highlands, um, very jealous of that. Um, I've always wanted to do the, can, there's a the 500 kilometer famous route, I think around a beautiful um, section up in the Highlands that I've always wanted to do. Uh, writing, Phil, I know you're an avid writer. Um, I find writing in lots of different ways. I know you write books and stuff, but actually just getting into the practice of just reflecting and writing down kind of what you've been thinking about today and connecting that to your emotions and behaviors can be particularly uh, valuable. So you look here, we're already getting from people a huge, uh, uh, hugging my daughter. So yeah, relationships are so important. Um, I've just, you might tell behind me right now, I'm, I'm sitting in my daughter's nursery we've just had I've been pushed out of the living room to be in here to keep out of the way um yeah I mean I hope already so this is exactly what I wanted to happen I hope you can see already between just this this group in the in in um this meeting today in this webinar today we're already probably got up to 20 different things and what we found is actually already with our community we've got hundreds of different activities that people do to look after their mind a lot of the work that we do is not um, often getting people to do new, new things is getting them to optimize the things that they're already doing, which they might not have even realized the value of it. So a lot of it, people do already have mental health routines, but they're subconscious, um, unloved, and often not invested in enough. So that was brilliant. I'm going to keep moving now. Um, I think uh, life drawing, pottery, supervision, I think that's a really nice one. And I think we can segue near the end towards practical things that we can actually do in the workplace. And I think that's hopefully where we can get to um, by the end. So personal wellness routines. The really important word here is personal. What I'm saying here are just some principles. People will have different ways about going about different things, but I hope this is a useful framework for you to kind of reflect on and hopefully implement going forward. So what do we think at Mindful is absolutely essential. Number one, it's got to be personalized. What works for me is gonna be very different to what works for you. That's precisely by the fact that actually it's the mind that makes us who we are. It's our character, it's those 9 billion neuronal connections. It needs to be holistic. So we need to be working across the board. That feels, fits into the biopsychosocial model that I was talking about. And it also means that we've got a broad base. So actually if life events throw us out into a different trajectory and actually we have to leave certain activities behind, it means that we've still got another base to build upon. It means that we can be more sustainable and that we can actually create a long-term wellness routine that works for, for us throughout our lives. It needs to be incremental. We need to be realistic about the fact that we can't do all this in one go. It needs to be adaptable. It needs to be fun and it needs to be smart. And I'm going to go into a little bit more detail on each of these. So personalized, um, I've already talked about this. The other important point here is that you, the only way you're going to find out what works for you is to go out into the world and try it for yourself. So for me, it's taken me quite a long time and I have to invest a lot of time into my mental health because I have bipolar. It's taken me, it took me a good 10 years to get to a point where I was stable enough to build um, on the efforts that I was putting into my life. My cycle of movement on a yearly kind of, kind of two yearly basis, I would go into a very deep depression or I'd become hypermanic. And a lot of the hard work that I've been putting in would get lost. Um, so, you know, some people will need different levels of investment to get to that stability and that understanding. But for me, it's been a long, long journey. And that's what gives me, I think, the right to talk about these types of things. For me as well, because I have bipolar, medication and therapy have been an important part of that. I'm not going to go into detail about that today, but that yet again depends on the individual. 
what we, I really want to focus though on is these social factors. And what we do at Mindful is try and gamify it a bit. We want to basically help people find um, their own routine and collect their own badges, a bit like Scouts for the Mind. So for me, for example, cold showers or some form of thermal shocks is really important. I find it has a big impact on my day. Writing, stroke journaling, um, both of those activities, getting things out of my head onto paper is hugely valuable. Team sports is somewhere where I can get a lot of input externally. I can reconnect with people and get rid of quite a lot of pent up energy and, and negativity. Breath work for me, um, it's really important, I think, for me to call it breath work, not meditation. I don't think it, for some people it can become something much bigger, but breath work can be really, really simple. It's just a matter of slowing down your breathing for five or 10 minutes um, in the morning and the evenings, and that can have a big impact. Wild swimming, going out there, a bit of adventure, feeling um, a sense of self-esteem, like I'm doing something um, different to what most people do. And body clock for me is not just about sleep, but it's about recognizing when do I actually work well and actually not putting myself under pressure to achieve and work um, hard at times that don't really work for me, which for me happens to be the mornings um, often. So apologies if I'm not quite on it right now. So what I'm really trying to show you there is my routine and hopefully through me describing mine, you can start to think how your routine might look like. Um, holistic, um, like I was saying, we want to bring uh, this strong foundation and mindful we do this by identifying five core pillars and I'll go through um, further down the line a little bit of detail on that. But what that means is it's basically having a recognition of actually that there are different areas of your wellness that you can work on. And some people will need more work on different areas, but it is really valuable to have at least a little bit of a toe in all of those pillars. Um, this is the, um, this, the idea of it being incremental. The journey is not gonna be one kind of um, movement forward. Uh, it's gonna be, a bit like a game of snakes and ladders, but we just got to make sure that those ladders are longer than the, the snakes. There is, um, people will be at different stages on their wellness journey. So we would always recommend that people start with their basic needs. And by that, we're really meaning the me pillar, looking after yourself, getting yourself to that point uh, where you can um, start moving forward. Um, I'm just checking the chat again. Um, oh, Carl, I love that. I have a happiness list to remind me of all these moments. Absolutely brilliant. Nostalgia for me is the word I use just to bracket those types of things. Um, it can be really powerful just to lean in and just remember um, the positive um, experiences. Um, cool. Going to keep moving here. So the next step is when you've got that kind of in place, the social element, that sense of belonging, going out there, team sports, volunteering, meeting your neighbours, feeling like you have a sense of community. And this would also include how you interact and engage with your colleagues at work or your employees who you work with. After that, we bracket nature and creative into self-esteem, going out there, trying new things, feeling like you're achieving something and actually building skills to integrate into your life. And lastly, once you've built that really strong uh, base, we go for what would be called a self-fulfillment um, exercises, kind of expansion of your horizons. And it's these um, steps that are really kind of follow kind of Maslow's um, needs um hierarchy of needs i don't know if you've come across that before so that shows you a sense of where we're going please do let me know if some of this isn't making sense me is quite obvious um so yeah try and lower your stress look after yourself social quite obvious again i'm going to flick through these nature um i think we can all probably recognize when we get outside even if it's just in our garden to do some weeding if it's correct put some house plants in our house or bigger things like actually going on a trek or doing some hiking Getting out to nature really does help us get perspective. Um, and just, you know, we know now there's a lot of evidence coming out of Japan around forest bathing and just being around organisms like trees, which, you know, live for 300, 400 years, uh, walking around those and the light and the noises just have a huge calming effect on, on our um, inner kind of nervous system. Uh, create, um, yet again, quite obvious, but it doesn't need to be anything particularly. Um, you know, I, for example, my create um, one is just doodling. I like to doodle whilst I'm in meetings. That's good enough for me. I'm not a, an artist by, uh, in, in, by any stretch of the imagination. And lastly, expand, you know, go beyond, you know, build your resilience and improve your confidence. Um, adaptable, this is just, I mentioned it again, but life events come along, you know, it might be parents um, getting unwell. It might be some illness with one of your children or 
Um, it might be that your business is under a lot of stress at the moment because of the macroeconomic climate or you've lost a big client. We are always going to be faced with these problems. We cannot um, create an environment where we are living in a constant state of contentment and comfort. We can try and get more into that position, but it's unrealistic to do that. Um, uh, Phil, you've asked quite a lot of current world a bit stuck at me or basic level. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is important. So um, and some of the guys in, um, and girls in the room know uh, Matthew Bushel, who's our head of partnerships. He came up with this Maslow's um, um, uh, hierarchy of needs for us and adapting that to our wellness. And I think trying to create a framework or a structure is really important and taking it beyond that level. Yeah. So being adaptable is really important. Fun. Um, yeah, again, this might not seem very obvious, but there's no point in kind of having these hypothetical ideas about what we should be doing if we're not actually going to end up doing them. And the only way we're going to do them is actually if that motivation and desire to do those activities is there. And that's why Mindful has always had a big focus. Though we're a B2B, we also we always make sure that we're really thinking about the consumer at the end, kind of the B2B brackets to see. We want to make sure that what we're creating is actually enjoyable and engaging so people actually spend enough time on it to actually make those positive behavioral changes. Uh, lastly, SMART, I'm sure a lot of you come across SMART goals before, I'm not going to go into the detail here, but creating um, really practical, um, measurable um, and you know attainable, all those things around SMART that we know we can apply to CPT, cognitive behavioral therapy, we can apply to business goals as well. It's so important to create that structure so that we can actually mark kind of our progress and get a sense that we're going in the right direction so with that structure in, in place what i um want to do now is just a bit of an ex a, a few questions around you know what you you kind of already do again but also what you already do in in the working environment with your employees to try and support their wellness because we will all have different views around how much of a responsibility there is on the employer upon kind of the leaders in the business to take on people's mental health and mental wellness which is fundamentally um, the individual's responsibility but I think increasingly um, the culture and the expectations around that are changing and I think what we find a lot is is that yes we need to um, know where that line is but there is a responsibility for the workplace to it, it create an environment where people can be empowered to look after themselves. There's a baseline of creating the right ingredients so that the culture and the people can feel supported. Um, so we're not saying you're taking on the responsibilities of these people's mental wellness routines, but we need to try and give them um, the structure to support them to do that. And that's incredibly important when we actually recognize, you know, during our most active, most able years of our lives, we spend close to 60% of our waking hours in the workplace. So there is a responsibility to think about how that time is impacting people's mental health. So now that we've gone through a bit more, um, I thought, first of all, we've put down quite a few things that people are already doing. Are any things coming into people's minds now that they think they could add um, to the mix? Kind of, And I say mix purposely here. We see if we were to try and put an analogy to our approach or, or, or compare our approach to a business or a big business, we would always use Spotify as the example, not, for example, Netflix. So Netflix is about consuming content and then going on to the next piece and going on to the next piece. Spotify, or how I see it, is with your mental wellness routine is about consuming content to then add it to your playlist so that you've got that longer term routine of 10 or so songs or 10 or so activities that you can go back to. So um, thanks, Carly. It's great to have you here. Um, yeah, so does anyone want to just think of now that we're maybe thinking about it slightly differently with the pillars and different actions, is there anything that comes into mind that you might add to your routine? Um, Martin, I can see your hand up and Ollie as well. Hey, Nick, fantastic presentation. I mean, I, I just wanted to jump into this little part of the conversation and I love the way you're using Spotify as a reference point. Um, it's something I've heard other people do. I do it myself because I think it's got so much more flexibility and it's not about saying this is what is the answer. It's like curate your own solutions, but you know, take them with you and own them. And when you give them a name and you make choices about how you're helping yourself, 
it's so much more powerful. So I just wanted to sort of amplify that idea because I think it is such a good reference point um, and that we are always tweaking our own playlists because we fall out of love with a song and then we replace it with something that sounds fresh and then we fall out of love with a habit or, or a little tweak to our, our routine and then we replace it. So I think that that sort of temporary flexibility but long term is super good. So that's all I wanted to share. Thanks, Martin. Yeah, that, I think you've you've explained that much better than me. And I think there is something, yeah, very different about that relationship we have with Spotify, for example, and 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 Netflix. And I, yeah, I thank you for that. Um, I think Ollie, you had your hand. Did you have your hand up as well, Ollie? Yeah, uh, just to pick up on what you said about the teams and and introducing um, sort of mind mindfulness um, wellness into your. Uh, your staff or your your team what I used to do and it worked and it was very very effective and some great ideas used to come out of it we were based in central London and we would do the Thames bridges so we would start at Tower Bridge cross and go all the way down to uh I think Albert Bridge in the, in the west that walking is so powerful in a group and you can cover lots of areas stresses that maybe a little bit um, invisible, um, but so much used to come out of it, so much good. And people were often, you know, if they, they knew they was gonna be on a walk for the next two or three hours, they were often quite candid and you'd learn so much from this. Yeah, I think that's a brilliant example. And I um, I will answer, get, get back to Ollie because I think the there's some really interesting things there. So basically when you're, in a state of flow or walking, it totally changes your relationship. So I won't go into too much detail, but basically the majority of your brain power is spent on uh, actions or behaviors that are so ingrained that you don't have to think about them. So most of what we, so, and what you do when you start walking like that is actually you allow um, less think in your kind of controlling cognitive kind of, um, I need to be careful what I say. And you go back actually more into um, a more open way of speaking and, the, and actually the more extreme way of allowing that and I, you have to be careful how you do this but if you actually stare at someone directly in their face and you start trying to have a conversation um, that also disconnects your more cognitive more inner critic controlling part of your brain and it means that people find it really hard not just to say what's in their mind so there's some really clever tricks that you can do about that and I think that the the walking one uh, we do an urban walking um, uh, idea on the app as well I think there's something unique or very different about the experience of walking through a, a city and I and I think particularly in a city like London where there's that bustle there's that energy there's that history you can really capture a lot of different um, elements there that I'm going to move on though because I thought this comment by there was a brilliant comment by um, uh, I want to yeah not things not to do here we go uh, was it Mary Jo um, yeah, brilliant. I think this is something that I always um, think that we haven't been able to integrate into our, our digital product yet, but is this thing around, um, and I think there is a spectrum here. I think it's not healthy necessarily to think of like bad habits and good habits because you can normally turn most ha bad habits into good habits in terms of how you, you manage them. But there is something about, um, you know, this also goes back, I don't know if you were, Mary, were on the call earlier, but about this thing about saying no, to things as well and I think a more general point there which I think did come up in the conversation I might have missed it because I joined late uh, the last call but the there's this really good book at the moment out called um, 4,000 Weeks um, and it's not saying anything particularly new but it's talking about our relationship with time and the big point there I think is is this fact that the modern world that we live in uh, the consumer focused the capitalist world that we live in is telling us this lie that if we're super productive and work really hard, we can have it all. But actually, that is simply not the case, is it? Because you could only have it all if you had infinite time to do everything. So there's this real um, acceptance, I think, that a lot of busy people, a lot of high achievers, a lot of business owners need to try and kind of reconnect with is actually, I can't do it all. My to-do list is never going to completely disappear. And I have to make decisions about what I realistically can do. And it kind of comes back to smart goals there. But I think the set, the deciding what not to do is just as important as deciding what to do. Um, thanks a lot. I'm just checking. Um, 
I'm going to keep moving, actually. Um, so, yeah, Phil's talking more about team routines and obviously Ollie um, segued into that as well. We're going to get into that now. The, the first question I just wanted to ask is um, kind of the people in this room is, you know, what would your, you know, let's start now with not with a magic wand, like ridiculous suggestions. But if you had some resource or you had the in terms of time and a little bit of um, um, other resource, what would you what do you think your employees need right now? What would be the biggest wins? What could you, you know, to, to, to actually change? or improve the mental um, health of your employees? And Nick, why are um, uh, people writing this out at uh, a uh, hands up for a question? Yes, th yeah, thank you so oh, much, sorry, Gary. sorry, I missed that, sorry. No, that's absolutely fine. Um, I'm an HR consultant, so this, this whole section is really of real interest to me, as is the whole um, presentation. And I was just going to follow on from what Oli said, is in that, you know, sometimes you have to be a bit more creative Sometimes, um, you know, these well-being sort of strategies can be a bit too prescriptive. And, you know, it's like yoga or it's it's a fruit bowl or it's something like that. And I think you have to speak to your employees to find out what right is, is right for them. So it might be an employee survey or some sort of feedback as to what would be most beneficial to your team rather than imposing a solution that might not be um, workable for your particular uh, team of employees. That's all. That's all I was going to say. Yeah, thank you. you um, is it Edua? Is that how I pronounce the name? Sorry. Yes, that's right, Edua. Oh, good, Edua. Um, yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I'm not going to talk too much about our actual offering, but uh, you know, a big part is, you know, you have to check in on the organisation itself as to where it is already, and then you can work out how much investment you need to even start doing any work so you know we, we we break down our offering into uh kind of what we call consultancy and coaching to start with just to to find out where we are and then we do um we actually offer our service in terms of workshops and um the app but i i, I might reference that right at the end but i couldn't agree more with you there's no point it goes back to the purse just just like an individual is is totally needs to be totally personalized it also needs to be totally personalized to the um to the team as well and that might even be within an organization so you might decide that actually the the head the, um the head office for example who are sitting in front of screens kind of in a hybrid environment like they will need a totally different um package to um people working on the on the shop floor or, or stuff like that um table tennis i love that table tennis is for me just for so many reasons it's nostalgic it reminds me of being younger it's it's totally engrossing it takes you totally out of your head and it can be you know lots of it is something that can be put into the workplace um you know quite practically relative to most sports uh okay we've got some other ones here this is great uh got the sales yeah flexible working hours should be yeah so i think that's a really good point from nadia is is that another thing maybe that you edua might have noticed is, is that a lot of employees generally find it quite frustrating when it's kind of these quite pretty superficial offerings at the front that kind of sound but actually they're the more important things around flexibility of working how how hybrid work are not being addressed and i think you need to try and um start from the more fundamental problems first before you go to the kind of here's a class and uh, on yoga and stuff like that um i've got supervision from mary jo uh yeah, I think the for me, especially in my role as a CEO at Mindful, the supervision and also the other thing is, I think, worth saying here, being candid is, is that, you know, I have to be really, really careful about, um, you know, we're, we're, we're a company that is meant to be, um, you know, we have to practice what we preach, I suppose, is what I'm trying to say. And I think it's and yet I find myself having to it's it's scary how often I'm I do delay kind of some of the work around people and culture like it's still even for someone like me totally motivated and, and believing in it it still sometimes gets pushed down the line so I think um and why did I say that I think supervision for me is the one like mainstay that I will never let go I think giving some your people especially in a, in a high stress kind of potentially high growth small business giving them a sounding board a consistent sounding board to feel listened to and to know that they're not isolated i think is is probably one of the most important building blocks i think for any size business um 
cool. Shervey's um, trust and flexibility. Yeah, all of these things. Thank you, Angela. Uh, Angelina, sorry. Um, okay, so let's just keep moving. So these are just, so what can we do at work? So, I mean, we've, we've come up with a few ideas right now. I think it'd be, no, I'm not going to hold you accountable to this, but it's useful just to think in that mindset of being a business owner. Maybe let's not think we're in a forum now at necessarily at Stand Up to Startup. Maybe you're, you're in that room, you found 10 minutes to think about your people and culture. Can you put um, down um, what, what you might be able to do tomorrow or as soon as we get back from Easter in the next week or two? What changes might you be able to make? So I'm just going to reel off a few examples because I think it can help. So yet again, going back to the playlist or Spotify, one of the, the best changes that we, yeah, shared playlist, well done, Gary, brilliant. So um, the changes I've made to a couple of our clients in the NHS was to just make a, um, get the team to create a shared playlist. And we, you'd, the team would make a commitment to play that playlist in the office on the, on the ground, if people were up there for an hour during uh, Thursday lunchtime. And that playlist is, is so positive for lots of reasons. One, you get to listen to music. Two, you get to learn about your colleagues' taste in music. And three, you probably get to learn about some music that you hadn't come across before and you, which you can add to your kind of um, playlist going forward. And it's, it's a brilliant way of, I think, like music doesn't have many boundaries. Um, yeah, yes, we all have different tastes and stuff like that. But if it's in that environment of sharing and kind of listening to each other, I think it can make a, you know, even that small change can make a really positive difference. Check in. So by this, I don't mean supervision, but just having a culture of just saying actually um, a 10 minute check-in which isn't about day-to-day -day work but is about just talking about how you're feeling um, at work what's stressing you out whatever and that's a culture where it can be done um, in different kind of in a flat hierarchy type role so people can do can request to do it from the bottom up or top down um, mentoring so this yet again is different to supervision um, I think I often play a mentoring role within my business. I think it's, yeah, again, it's about being able to hold boundaries and being not being that day-to-day -day manager or, or super, supervision role, but just really supporting some of those people in your company about where they're going with their career. And I find a lot of the time what people really uh, value there is, is being able to hold their bigger view than just thinking about their performance within the business. Houseplants, pretty obvious, but actually... Um, can be really positive. And I think champions here leads into quite a lot of these points. I will stop talking in a second, but champions basically means a lot of these things do take time to implement. It needs someone on the ground who's an enthusiast supporting it. And it ne they need more support than just being an extra piece of work to their day-to-day -day job. And it doesn't need to be a huge amount. It can just be saying, look, you're in your role, role, you will have two hours of protected time a week to try and implement some of these things. And obviously it depends on the size of the organization as to how many people you need to do that. I think comms in terms of ops, like I find this, it's, if you, I think another area that small business owners, and, and they're often it's such a hard line, but we don't invest enough in our operations and systems, which makes the whole process of actually delivering work for the team much less satisfying. So I think showing a commitment to that and getting a, a gradual improvement in the efficiency of the way in which people deliver work can have a really positive impact on people's um, mental health, openness, creating a, a kind of vulnerable open environment where actually leaders are able to show their vulnerabilities, to show that they have weaknesses. Um, acceptance, this is more around accepting um, what's, what is real right now. Like for example, at Mindful, uh, we're a tiny startup. We have uh, only three full-time employees. We have about six part-time employees. Things are in flux a lot of the time. And a lot of the time I just have to set boundaries and say, look, this is where we're gonna be for the next three months. It is gonna be chaotic if it's feeling like too much. These are the channels you can go down, but there's no, I don't want promising too much can have really negative impacts. And lastly, I think goals are going back to that smart goals and stuff like that. But it's not about, I think people get quite scared around goals, around accountability and about, you know, is it pushing people into a very kind of um, delivery focused um, kind of priorities, but actually goals is more about being able to, to kind of, what I think anyway, is about be able to celebrate wins if you haven't set goals how can you know when it's time to celebrate and say well done so those are just a few examples for me i don't know if any of those really um kind of stick out to you um i'd love to know your thoughts um on this basically totally agree with that eduard and i think um 
in bigger organizations i think a lot of the time you know so i'm i'm the um co-chair of the mental health network at my um nhs trust which is the central northwest london mental health care trust employs eight thousand people um you know that whole equality diversity and inclusion network so i think there are um opportunities often to find people who are engaged in that kind of space are often kind of similar there's a lot of overlap there so it's finding those people throughout the organization that, and it's really important um that it's not just hr yeah okay just we're gonna keep thing, nick uh, oh, sorry ollie on on goals and having um celebrating small wins um in our sales office we used to have a gong tied to the scene so every order or big purchase order come in or contract win we'd smash that gong and you used to see the smiles around the, the room everyone was involved in it uh we had you know it was it was a fantastic thing i, I went back to the firm two weeks ago and they still got the gong and it is such a talking point and it's things like that that build a team little things like that that can really help galvanize a, a team but that gong yeah. we used to have our neighbors go oh what, what's that noise you know and it was it was laughable well i think that humor element to it is what's really come coming or ringing out to me there you know i think there is because i I think, yeah, I think that's a brilliant idea. And I think that, yet yeah, again, that's about being creative and being human about how you um, integrate some of these things that can become quite cliche and sterile because of the way in which um, they've been often put forward. So yeah, I, lo I love that. And I think that way of thinking could be applied to lots of other areas, um, actually. Humor is such, um, so important. Humor is so important. And having fun, as you said, Nick, you're spending so much time in a commercial role or, or, or in a job or in, you know, as a founder, running a business, building a business, have fun where you can. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think the, um, yeah, I'm glad it's good. It's nice for me to hear that cycle back in because it is often, you know, out of those core principles that we talk about it, you know, often it, it doesn't get the same time. And I think it, it is so important to remember that. Um, Thanks, Holly. Uh, so Phil's just said something here. We often don't encourage teams to set and own their own goals. Yes. So I think, in, you know, the word that I do love, which um, is empowering, like I don't, you know, I hope from a lot of the principles, Phil, that we've put forward, it's quite obvious that we at Mindful don't think that top down kind of us telling people what to do is what's right. And I think that's why I always, and, you know, the end goal is, in these types of presentations to talk about what we can do in the workplace as a team but i always start with the personal wellness because for me that's very logical um we obviously have to make adaptations to um but to our own personal wellness routines when we're trying to apply them in a group you know we have to make um adjustments but i think if we start from somewhere and we know why we've made those adjustments and we've done and, we, and why we've kind of leaning in as a team then i think it 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 kind of the, the the narrative and the whole um is so much more natural and people understand why these things are being done um and i think yeah that would help a lot with kickback i think the um so thanks for that phil um being clear with people's teams is important i love gideon has put in like dare to leave Bernie brown yeah be clear to be kind i think there's a lot of um and i find myself doing it sometimes you I'm a, I'm a big people pleaser. I don't know if that comes across or not. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know if I achieve that, but I am, I try to be without wanting to be, but I think the, as a leader, there's often lots of reason incentives to try and, um, uh, what's the word kind of, um, make things kind of feel a bit simpler and cleaner and, and kind of basically there are lots of reasons to kind of project the most positive side of things and i think if you constant sometimes that's necessary and there's a balance of course like you motivation and, and confidence and traction is so important in these size businesses but if you keep keep doing it um and it, it can have very negative um and it, it just creates a distrustful relationship between you and your people so i think 
uh, with a pinch, Gideon, I totally agree with what you're saying, but with a pinch of salt of kind of like, actually sometimes one has to kind of hold some of that stress, I, I find as a, as, a, as a leader. And I don't know what people feel about that, but um, um, explicitness, yes, thank you, Angelina, yeah, yeah. I think, um, you know, I, there's a lot of going around and I don't know, I, I uh, the size of our business and the way in which we run, like there's a lot of it is about taking people on the journey with you. So I'm ultra open and explicit. So I show people, all of our employees, once they've been there for three months, or even if they're part-time and been with us for at least three or six months, they'll, they'll have access to my cash flow forecast. They'll know my overall thinking. I don't want to bring... I. I don't want to pretend that what they're getting into is yes, it's very exciting and we're growing and it's big, but we're tiny and actually there's always there, there are risks associated with, with being a small business. So I think being open um, and I think it's interesting because of the space that we're in, it's it's also there's a big risk I find and I I still fall into it around leaning in um, to people into people's um, commitment to the mission and the cause. So and actually almost um doing that too much and actually i think there's a, a responsibility to not uh, lean yes you want to build that culture we have a really strong culture but i often sometimes have to check myself and be like actually are they are people working too hard here are they putting too many things on the line because of um the mission and the vision that we're on nadia i see you've got your your hand up yes hi i think one of the the challenges for a team or a leader is that even if you say yeah I listen you only listen to the people who speak because you know there'll be the shy person who won't speak up or there'll be the other I worked in a in a startup and it was about 15 of us and it was always you know we all everyone always did what the, the loudest people decided <laughs> like I mean and you know like table tennis was one of the perks and I didn't really like table tennis <laughs> and I suggested other things um but I wasn't listened to but that's a different matter but yeah it's I feel like that's one of the biggest challenges is listening really listening to everyone yeah I think um the problem is is it is that as we to listen to everyone and to I think that's I suppose being frank like when we try and um, we're selling our product at the moment. I think a lot of businesses are very turned off on. They want, they they're very um, focused on, on seeing change like straight away. I think they, what they find, what we find hard is to to tell them that this isn't going to work unless we go in and spend a few grand on actually validation, listening to people, getting the full picture, and that's always what we want to do. But I think the truth is, is that. It's probably not as much of a resource as they as they think, but um, I think that it's this thing of um, not being prioritised enough, actually. Because I think listening to people, I suppose, being honest and, and using myself as an example, I well, the, the most I think humans fundamentally are very reactive people. That's something we just is that is the truth. So you're going to have to make very conscious, proactive decisions as a leader to change that because the inherent or the natural state is is that if everyone's working hard and busy um it's going to go in that direction that you're you're describing so it does require quite a conscious um kind of determined decision by the leadership to make to make those changes i'm afraid i think that's just the truth i'm afraid and I've, we see it a lot that business leaders aren't don't see the value often in that as well they don't they don't want to do surveys and do one-on-one -on -one interviews and stuff like that because I don't know that's just something that we found um I'm not that's not really an answer but it's um I'm, it's accepting that it's, it's a problem <laughs> um so I think I'm just going to keep um go moving now because we've got another we've got just another five minutes so I always do this in any presentation I do now so it doesn't matter what the subject is but you know we've talked about quite a lot here what I'm asking you to do is just to see if you can just identify one thought that has really come out at you. It can be big or small. It doesn't need to be a big philosophical thought. It could just be, oh, that was interesting. Or, oh, oh, I'd love a table tennis table at, uh, at work or whatever it is. Just hold, try and find that thought. I'll give you kind of 20, 30 seconds and just hold it there for a sec, for a bit. 
and then um i'll just give a bit more time so I, and then just try and think is there an emotion that, that that comes when you have that thought in mind and then is there actually something practical or a behavior that it doesn't need to be something actually on the ground but is there something that you want to change in the way you're thinking um or something that you're doing kind of in the workplace um and it's a useful exercise to do it's worth you know thoughts emotions and behaviors there's lots of um kind of therapy principles around particularly around dialectical behavioral therapy around this connection between thought emotion and behavior and how there are pathological forms where that's interesting but for anyone we we don't often have a clear sense of how those three are connected and it's worth just sometimes exploring those three steps um and you know just so you know like i was saying we now at mindful for work we do coaching uh, the app and workshops to offer an integrated um service to businesses big or small um it is kind of um i'm not going to go into too much of it now but what we do that's different or why you might want to work with us or you might think of suggest recommending other people to us we're, we're looking for for business at the moment but is that we are kind of validated this has been kind of led by me for the last three years we're using best clinical practice to inform how we're delivering our product it's hybrid so we have digital and human approaches that can work at home and uh, at work it's authentic uh, the three leaders within the business myself my co-founder and our head of partnerships all have bipolar um so we're very this is a very much kind of personal kind of mission for us and it's gamified um this is kind of leaning into that idea of being fun uh scouts for the mind you know people collect badges uh, and build their own wellness routine with us um and at your company so mm -hmm.